In this episode of the Diplomacy Dojo, your bored brother answers an email from a reader of the blog. This is part two of two. You talked about how the juggernaut isn't as strong as everyone thinks. Do you think the wintergreen is stronger than the juggernaut? Also, you talk a lot about the fact that Russia is not a corner power. I wondered if you can expand on this. And finally, an elaborate question about the corner power concept, which I will discuss when I get to the corner power question. So the next question here from Dave is, uh, to address to me, you talked about how the juggernaut isn't as strong as everyone thinks. Do you think the wintergreen is stronger than the juggernaut? So for the benefit of listeners, the juggernaut is the fan name for the Russia-Turkey alliance. And Wintergreen is the fan name for the Russia-Italy alliance. I'll begin by, by saying, how do I assess the strength of alliances? When I think about an alliance being strong, I imagine how the players can coordinate their pieces together uh, to maximize early tactical gains and overpower their neighbors and mutual, mutual rivals. I think that makes an alliance very strong. For example... A Germany-Austria, quote-unquote, alliance or mutual understanding is pretty common, at least that the, that the German and Austrian player agree not to attack each other, to not attack each other. But as an alliance, it's not that strong because Germany is trying to concentrate power west to deal with France and England, and Austria is trying to concentrate power south to deal with Italy, Turkey, and to a certain extent Russia, usually. Uh, and so although Austria and Germany can coordinate a little bit to fight against Russia, they usually cannot do so until mid or late game. So even if Germany and Austria have agreed like, oh, we're allies until the very end, we're best friends, etc., the other alliances in the game are a lot stronger because Austria and Germany don't have much opportunity to work together until they've already taken out uh, some of their early foes. So the value of the alliance is not really so much in terms of its strength in its its tactical strength and the players they can take down, but more in the diplomatic advantage of of you know having one less thing to worry about and passing along information. And you can kind of spring this trap that pe- players may not realize that Germany and Austria have been working together on a diplomatic level so closely. And then late in the match they are they are shocked to find out that Germany and Austria are really good allies or something. It's it's got its advantages. Uh, but by contrast an Austria-Russia alliance is incredibly strong because Austria and Russia can join their units together to make these attacks on their neighbors right away. Austria and Russia can can probably take down Turkey uh, as long as nobody bothers them, and Turkey is the strongest defensive power in the game. They can take out Turkey, usually no problem, uh, as long as nobody bothers them. And then Austria, with a, with a flank protected uh, allied to Russia, can usually take down Italy as well. If, if given the, the opportunity and the time, Austria can, can usually overpower Italy in this alliance. And uh, meanwhile, if Russia is now fighting Germany, Austria can't really invade Germany that much on its own. But together with Russia, oh, they can just blast Germany by, by, by coming over into Munich and Berlin early on. I mean, maybe not on the first year, but you know, within a couple of years, they could do something like that. Austria-Russia alliance has explosive growth potential because they can expand all over the map in a bunch of different directions early on, working together with their units supporting each other. Every single unit that Russia and Austria have and build in the first year can be used to further this alliance's expansion. That alliance has incredible strength in the sense that I am using the word. Now, what an alliance like Austria-Russia lacks is stability, because Austria and Russia are are very close neighbors, and the their expansion paths may eventually start overlapping with each other. They can only get so far before it starts looking a lot easier to take each other's supply centers than to expand further away from each other. So around mid-game, that alliance, if it's done well, can get pretty tense as every build Austria and Russia get is so proximate to the other and it's looking really easy for them to backstab, you know, let's say 
that Russia has taken Turkish centers or Austria has taken Turkish centers. It looks really easy for those units that have captured those centers to whip around and backstab the ally. So later on, that alliance lacks stability, whereas the Germany-Austria alliance has incredible stability by comparison because Germany being able to build fleets in the north can expand all over the north into supply centers that Austria would never bother with. And Austria can concentrate on southern supply centers like the Turkish home centers, the Balkans, Italy, Russia, all these places that uh, Germany often has nothing to do with. There's a slight overlap. You know, Germany and Austria both may have an interest in who controls Warsaw and Moscow, but it's just two supply centers, not much. And so in mid-game, that alliance can, can suddenly really come to life because the players often have other things to do then completely invade and destroy each other or to stop each other from making more captures. Indeed, a Germany-Austria alliance is one of the only alliances I have ever played in my 10-year career playing diplomacy. I've played that alliance to a two-way draw. And uh, I was not trying to play for a two-way draw. I was trying to solo win. But um, at, at the end of the match, we had both completely captured our entire spheres, Germany, the whole north, and I, Austria, the whole south. And so the game ended in a draw because we both had a stalemate line. How interesting. That's like that's not possible for Austria and Russia. Their positions don't naturally sit on any uh, defensible stalemate line situation. The, the, the alliance gets more and more unstable uh, as the match goes on. So what I think the juggernaut has going for it and why it's a uh, alliance that has such an interesting reputation, why players think of it as strong, is that um, it's a very stable alliance. And I think it is perhaps the most stable alliance that either of those powers, Turkey and Russia, has. But I don't think it's that strong. Here's why. In the beginning of the match, Russia has a fleet in Sevastopol that can hardly do anything other than nuisance Turkey. It can kind of occupy a defensive, you know, defend, support, hold Romania or sit in Romania. But for the most part, it's just a nuisance to Turkey. And Turkish players have to put several turns worth of effort to get their starting fleet that that's in Ankara to get that fleet out through Constantinople or or whatever so a lot of times when Russia and Turkey are working together two of their units are doing nothing other than just kind of menacing each other like they'll repeatedly bounce in the black sea and even if Turkey can get the, that starting fleet out into the Mediterranean, Russia's starting fleet is still there doing almost nothing other than adding some anxiety for Turkey and some instability to the alliance. There are ways around it. There are ways around this. For example, crazy plans like getting Russia's fleet out into the Mediterranean early on or slightly less crazy but harder to sell to Russia, in my experience, finding a way to work together to disband Russia's fleet so that it can be rebuilt as an army to use elsewhere. Things like that. And where I'm going with this is, is that there are, although there are ways to overcome the lack of starting strength that the Juggernaut has, that's a lot of effort. That takes several turns. It's occupying a few pieces and moves, and maybe it's worth the effort. I'm not saying don't do it. I, I've done things like that to, to, to power up the Juggernaut. But that's what I'm saying. The Juggernaut requires a shot in the arm in order to achieve a level of power that Austria-Russia has just from the beginning if Austria and Russia are working together. So once the juggernaut gets going, it can be as strong as any other two power alliance. It's not, it's fine. Turkey and Russia can put a pretty good fight against Austria. But in my experience, in my opinion, unless Turkey and Russia really work hard or they get some assistance from another power like Italy, they can struggle to put all their forces to bear just to bring down Austria. Austria stands a decent chance of alone holding back the juggernaut. So, no, I don't think the juggernaut's really that strong. I don't. Where the juggernaut really feels like such a wonderful alliance, for, for the players anyway, is that if it gets going, if they destroy Austria... The players can expand indefinitely until the end of the match because Turkey can just keep going west, going through Italy, going through the Balkans, then Italy, and then trying to conquer uh, Western centers like Iberia or Marseille. And Russia, after Austria is destroyed, often has a free hand you know, to expand against Germany or even England and can put all these extra units 
it's really something. If you played a lot of diplomacy, it's a pretty rare sight to see Russia expand to such a huge extent in the West. And it's it's kind of fun to look at, even in my opinion. And the alliance is very stable. It can really go until the end of the game. A two-way draw, I don't think is realistic unless the players just want a two-way draw. But one of those powers will have it stand a decent chance of backstabbing the other very late in the game to get the solo win. And so this alliance is really desirable for Turkey or Russia because those are powers that, in my opinion, especially Turkey, really struggles to get into a solo winning position with other neighbor allies. Like, how is Turkey going to get into a solo win working with Austria or Italy? That's really tough because those are powers that want all the same centers that Turkey has and kind of walled off Turkey from being able to get past the stalemate line late in the game. Therefore, that this alliance is really good for Turkey. And, and to a certain extent, it's a, it's a good alliance for Russia because of how it enables Russia to be able to get to a solo win. I think Russia has more options in terms of allies. But uh, to the question, do I think Wintergreen is stronger than the Juggernaut? So the, in terms of how I've defined strength, I think that Wintergreen, like all other natural alliances, doesn't have a lot of inherent strength. And I'll explain. So the natural alliances are the alliances between powers that are not neighbors. Those are different than neighbor alliances. So Turkey's neighbors are Italy, Austria, and Russia, and those are those will be Turkey's potential neighbor allies. Turkey's natural allies are France, England, and Germany, because Turkey does not share a border with any of those powers at the start of the match. And uh, although they can work together, they don't have an immediate conflict. So we call them natural allies because being distant from each other, they don't have an immediate conflict. However, there's a problem here, which is that because the natural allies don't start off the match near each other, they can't help each other tactically either. The value of the natural alliances is that in later in the match, they have all these opportunities to work together where they're not nearly as threatening as neighbor alliances. I'll, I'll elaborate on this. So probably the most obvious natural allies of any two natural alliances is England-Turkey, for sure. Those powers are so distant from each other, and if one of those powers does well, it often has this ripple effect uh, or butterfly effect that, that helps the other powers well. Not every time, but often. Uh, their, their destinies are, are, are somewhat linked. And so uh, experienced English and Turkish players know this and will spend time sharing information and trying to help one another from the get-go, even though there's nothing they can do to tactically help each other. Absolutely not in early game, and even in mid game, it's pretty rare. It's it, it's it's unusual to see England and Turkey supporting each other's moves until end game, if ever. So, the value of an England Turkey alliance is in information sharing, diplomatic leverage, and the knowledge that you can probably trust the player helming this power a little more than the others because there's very little they can do to betray you, and a lot of your interests are shared, and and obviously so. So Wintergreen is one of these natural alliances. Italy and Russia do not share a border. They're not neighbors. And there are several powers in between them that they might work together against. Primarily Austria and Turkey, too, barely, and maybe Germany. But Austria and Turkey, for real, uh, those are powers that Italy and Russia have an incentive to work together against. And in the early game, there's not a whole lot they can do because it takes many turns for Italy and Russia to get pieces into a position where they can start supporting each other's orders. The exception being if Italy and Russia really pull the wool over the eyes of Austria and initiate a surprise attack successfully where like Italy gets into Tyrolia and Venice and Russia sneaks into Galicia. And so now in, in autumn 1901, Austria is totally surrounded by hostile units. If they can pull that off, then yeah, the Winter Green Alliance can start off with some explosive strength and uh, get growing right away. Aside from that one situation, it usually takes uh, some time for a wintergreen alliance to have opportunities because they have to expand or at least develop their positions for a little while somewhere ar around Austria or somewhere around Turkey or both uh, before they can start working together. If that happens, let's say there's a wintergreen alliance, uh, but Italy and Russia have agreed to first take out Turkey, then take out Austria for some strategic reasons. So after Turkey's gone... Then Italy and Russia start, they betray Austria and start picking Austria apart. That'll probably work. 
that'll be successful. And the alliance will have a lot of stability here because Italy and Russia's home centers are nowhere near each other. So the build that they get will not be immediately threatening. And uh, both powers have, it's pretty rare uh, for them to take each other's home centers except as a game-winning move. So this makes them natural allies, and uh, with the Winter Green Alliance has going forward, it has a lot of stability. Now, does the Winter Green Alliance have as much stability as Juggernaut? Eh, I think a little less. I think the challenge is that uh, after Austria and Turkey have been taken down, both Russia and Italy have a large number of armies in the Balkan area, or maybe in Anatolia, that don't have much they can do other than menace each other. And both powers probably need to control all of the Balkans and maybe even Anatolia in order to solo win. So there's some tension there. They might try to fight. Not a lot, uh, but some. A little more. I think it's a little more unstable than the Juggernaut, actually, which may be strange because Turkey and Russia are our neighbors. Other players may have had different experiences than me and have a different opinion on that. But it's just, just based on my personal experience, that's how I see it. So... Based on what I've said, uh, I think that on balance, Wintergreen is about as strong as the Juggernaut, where the Juggernaut needs a shot in the arm to get going, as I said, because they've got these units that can't do much other than fight, and they have to overcome that in order to work together. But once they start working together, it, it could be pretty good. Similarly, Italy and Russia need some opportunity to begin working together uh, because they are neighbor allies, whether that's a surprise attack on Austria that's successful or taking out one of their mutual rivals like Turkey or Austria, I'm sorry, one of their mutual neighbors like Turkey or Austria, and then they begin working together to take out another neighbor. Both of those um, are necessary. Something, something's got to happen before they can start working together. And so uh, in the scheme of all the alliances, I, I don't think that Wintergreen has this like, inherent power the way that some of the neighbor alliances do. But I do think that it has all the advantages of most of the natural alliances and that it, it, it's got a, a lot of stability and the players have usually good, obvious tactical reasons, incentives to trust each other. So addressing this next question addressed to me, uh, responding to this question addressed to me, you talk a lot about the fact that Russia is not a corner power. I wonder if you can expand on this. The concept of a corner power is a diplomacy player fan term for the map itself that the classic diplomacy board game is on a piece of card, or if you're playing it digitally, uh, an image that is a rectangle that has corners, and the players can't get around these corners even though in real life, in real life, you can go further than the boundaries depicted in this, in this map. The world is round, you know, it doesn't, doesn't have edges. But the map does, and that actually factors in significantly to the gameplay, that the, that the edge of the board is this huge thing in diplomacy. It's not about what it does, but what it prevents you from doing. So the corners refer to the situation where the, the pieces are bounded by two edges. And so this really circumscribes their movement. They're really fenced in when they're near these, these two edges. This means that the powers, the, it's really difficult to flank these parts of the board because if there's already an enemy piece occupying the space you're trying to get into, there's really not a whole lot you can do. So the corner powers have a defensive advantage and a strategic advantage. The defensive advantage is that they can't be flanked. And the strategic advantage is that once they start expanding, they don't have a back door that can be broken in on. The, the contrast is the central powers. The central powers that exist in the middle of the board are not near the edge, or at least they're not near multiple edges. And this means that, number one, they can be flanked, that uh, other players can just start walking around their defenses and attack them from multiple directions. They, they don't have a good defensive ability for this reason, or at least they don't have an unlimited defensive ability the way it feels like uh, the corner powers sometimes do. The other thing is that uh, because they're in the middle... It means even if they get off to a good start expanding in one direction, they have a back door that can be walked into, and uh, that makes it tough because they have to allocate resources to, to a defense, whereas a corner power may not have to. The corner itself acts as a kind of tactical defense. In my opinion, the one power that most embodies the concept of being a corner power is Turkey. 
And that is because as we get behind Turkey's home centers, Turkey's home centers being Constantinople, Smyrna, and Ankara, there are these provinces that are really hard to pass through. That's Armenia, Syria, and Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Not only are those provinces worthless, that they don't have any supply centers in them, it's worthless in the sense they don't have any, uh, they, don't, they don't count as towards your center count, but also because they alternate between sea and land spaces. In the north, you have like Black Sea and Sebastopol bordering Armenia, and in the south, you have Eastern Mediterranean Sea bordering Syria. It makes it really difficult to have the correct unit types needed to fully flank Turkey. Um, Russia wants to send in a fleet into Black Sea, and maybe Italy or Austria wants to send a fleet into Eastern Mediterranean, and then it's not really that helpful in getting into Armenia and Syria, the land provinces that are really needed to break Turkey's back. So that means that Russia often needs to guess and get an army into Armenia or from Black Sea support an army into Armenia, and some combination of powers maybe want to convoy an army from through Eastern Mediterranean into Syria. That's really difficult because Italy is two spaces away from Syria, which means Italy needs two fleets to double convoy an army into Syria. A lot of players call this tactic a Lepanto, the double convoy into Syria. That's all, that's all really difficult. In order to outflank Turkey and really grind down Turkey's defensive position, Italy needs three units just to, just to potentially get an army uh, where it needs to be. Turkey has three units to begin with, so Turkey can be fighting on multiple fronts and be blocking Italy's Lepanto, which wastes three of Italy's units just by moving a unit into Syria that blocks the convoy order. So Turkey can defend against a three-unit maneuver with just one unit. And uh, Turkey can block Russia from getting into Black Sea, which could be log jamming multiple Russian units with just one unit. And so in this way, there's there's more, you know, it, Turkey can block Italy from moving in Eastern Mediterranean Sea just by moving a fleet there, so on and so forth. What I'm trying to paint a picture here is that Turkey, because of Turkey's incredible corner position, Turkey can often defend against multiple potential attackers by preventing them from getting into position, that Turkey can waste two or three enemy units worth of movement with just one piece. And this means that Turkey has the greatest tactical defensive ability in all of diplomacy. The other powers that I consider to be pretty good corner powers, France and England, have similar things going on. They have similar things going on, not as good as Turkey, but they can similarly block uh, a lot of tactical maneuvers against them. England can lock down North Sea, and it's pretty hard to f to flank England from the east. France can fortify the area around Mid-Atlantic Ocean and make it really hard to get behind France's line. Again, neither of these are quite as good as Turkey, but still pretty good. By contrast, the central powers, Germany, Austria, and Italy, can struggle. They, they can get attacked from multiple directions pretty easily. Austria can be attacked by Italy, Russia, and Turkey in 1901 and just be destroyed. Austria's defensive position can completely collapse and Austria is limited by 1902. That's, um, that's pretty difficult. Austria is probably the most central of all central powers, being nowhere near any of the edges of the map. There are other advantages Austria has. Being a central power means you have interesting expansion routes and, a, and a, a new units that you build are always in a good position. Not trying to say that Austria is imbalanced or that central powers are weaker than the corner powers, just explaining the, the meaning and the implication of having that corner. So, since Germany and Italy and Austria, if they concentrate units in one direction, they can be out, they can just be backdoored in another, and they don't have a corner that they can back into for defensive purposes. The question is, why do I think Russia is not really a corner power? So literally, Russia's in the corner. That that St. Petersburg, one of Russia's home centers, is in the corner of the map. It, it occupies the corner, and Moscow is right next to it. it. Russia feels very crammed up up against that top right corner. So in the most literal sense, Russia is a corner power. By, by definition of this term, Russia is located in the corner. Russia is actually the only power who has home centers that are located in the corner of the map. So superficially, based on the analysis I've just given, you might think, well, doesn't that make Russia the most corner of all corner powers? Since Russia's home centers are in the corner, that should like, wow, that should make Russia have this really, really good defense. 
that intuition is incorrect. Russia actually has the worst defense, perhaps, of any power besides Austria. It's close. I think Austria has the worst defense, and probably Russia has the second worst, despite having this corner. That's because Russia's home centers of St. Petersburg and Sevastopol, they start off with fleets, which are almost useless in putting up a proper defensive perimeter because they can't do any support hold orders inland. Warsaw and Moscow are totally landlocked. And so those fleets that Russia has serve almost no defensive purpose. This is a reason, in my opinion, why Austria is kind of weak on defense in the beginning, is that Austria's starting fleet can't really help much in terms of if Austria needs a defense, Austria is in trouble. And Russia's got the same problem. Russia has an extra unit, great, but it's a fleet, so it doesn't help on defense. The way uh, Russia plays, in my experience in diplomacy, is that Russia's strategic posture is very similar to these central powers in that Russia has so many neighbors. Austria has four neighbors, Italy, Turkey, Russia, and Germany. And Russia has four neighbors, Turkey, Austria, Germany, and England. Germany has four neighbors, France, England, Austria, and Russia, and so on. Whereas the corner powers tend to have just three, uh, at least as I'm saying them. England's three neighbors are France, Germany, and Russia. France's three neighbors are England, Germany, and Italy. And Turkey's three neighbors are Italy, Austria, and Russia. Having that extra neighbor causes Russia to play a lot more like Germany and Austria, where Austria needs to put a lot of diplomatic effort into securing a flank, maybe two flank areas, in order to have uh, the ability to concentrate some force and expand uh, in one area of the map. By the way, Italy only really has, in my opinion, three neighbors, France, Austria, and Turkey. Like, functionally, Italy and Germany, I guess, like, they, they don't they don't play it the way neighbors play, even though they are very close to each other. Since Italy has only three meaningful neighbors, in my opinion, Italy actually plays a little bit more like the corner powers in many situations where Italy can put up a pretty decent defensive game. Just food for thought. I'm not saying Italy's a corner corner power. That's not what I mean to say. Just Just food for thought that the strategies that work for corner powers may have more utility playing as Italy than they do as Germany, Austria, or Russia. So I think that Russia benefits from strategic plays that are similar to Austria and Germany and a diplomatic style that is similar, where you put effort into negotiating alliances with your with several neighbors to find an opportunity to expand and use diplomacy to guard your flanks. That's why I think that Russia plays more like a central power than a corner power, despite literally having a corner. And I think Russia has very poor defense and requires a lot of diplomacy to play well. I see there's a follow-up question from Dave about Russia not being a corner power that says, I feel like the board is a slightly distorted mirror with each country apart from Russia reflected across the stalemate lines. There are two powers in their corner, England and Turkey, that have an aggressive relationship with Russia, two central powers, Austria and Germany, which have a defensive relationship with Russia, and two powers that share a corner and aren't threatened by Russia, France, and Italy. And because Russia is squashed into the south, Austria and Italy are weaker than their mirrors. Would you agree with this? Yes. I think that your analysis is spot on, Dave. I think this is a very accurate insight and one that I have believed myself for many years, and I just haven't had the opportunity to explain it on my blog very well, but I appreciate your bringing this up, and maybe I'll be able to write about it in depth someday. But yes, I agree. I think that uh, these mir- the mirrored powers, being England, Turkey, Germany, Austria, and France, Italy, are accurate. And this is because those powers have the ability to expand in a way that mirrors each other without menacing each other. Germany can expand west and north, and Austria can expand south and east, and that works out for each of this pair. They will not overlap in what they're trying to capture. They can expand. Again, I actually, I've mentioned before that the only two-way drive ever achieved was as Germany, Austria. And similarly, England and Turkey can expand towards each other, towards all three of their respective neighbors, and not necessarily overlap in the centers they're trying to capture. And this is fascinating because not everybody thinks of this, but France can decide to concentrate entirely north and west, and Italy can concentrate entirely south and east, and they can expand uh, quite a lot 
only needing maybe one center for the other from the other to cross the stalemate line, so to speak, and solo win. And I have seen um, two-way draws between Italy and France where the players were not really specifically trying to do this. It's just how the how the, the board played out. Similarly with England and Turkey. I think that um, your insight, Dave, that Russia has a an aspect in how these mirrors play out is is fascinating and an intelligent insight that uh, Germany and Austria both are kind of playing defense. They don't want Russia to, they want to be invaded by Russia and they may attack Russia, but that often comes later in the game. Whereas England and Turkey pretty much just want to invade Russia. Russia's not a, a significant threat to them early in the game. I mean, it can be, Russia can invade England and can invade Turkey, but Russia needs help from other players to do so. Whereas England and Turkey can, to a certain extent, unilaterally invade Russia, as long as nobody's attacking Turkey or nobody's attacking England, that power can usually take Russia out of their sphere uh, because Russia is so weak to begin with tactically. And I think this is this is reflected in how the relationship is mirrored. And I also agree that Austria is slightly weaker than Germany and that Italy is slightly weaker than France in part because Russia is located a little more thoroughly in the South. So uh, I agree with this analysis, and I'll elaborate on why I agree. In my uh, f quite famous now uh, board that describes the 17 supply centers that are, quote-unquote, the North and the 17 supply centers that are, quote-unquote, the South, that I've created to help players understand how to play gunboat diplomacy well, that concept applies to, to press diplomacy as well as gunboat because it's a tactical concept that's just inherent about how the board works. It's not as important in press diplomacy, to be sure, um, but it still has some relevance. The important part there is that three of Russia's home centers are in these 17 centers that make up the south, and just one is in the 17 centers that make up the north. That means that Russia's physical presence at the start of the game is, is more southern oriented it means that these that to completely take over the south russia must be almost thoroughly destroyed and not just picked that at st petersburg the way it is in the north so in many matches russia is eliminated from the north early on that england and germany or one or one or both of them takes russia out at st petersburg sometimes they'll cooperate to do this and then russia is never really able to go into the north or Russia just declines to get involved in the North because it's, that seems to be the likely outcome if Russia tries to play a Northern game. So oftentimes there are four powers contending for control of the South, Italy, Austria, Turkey, and Russia, and just three powers contending for control of the North, France, England, and Germany. For this reason, I think that the Northern powers are, all of them, slightly favored as a group. There are other reasons for this as well. It's easier for them to cross the stalemate line in the Mediterranean or even through the Balkans than it is for a southern power to cross out into the Atlantic or into the central part of the map. All that said, these slight balancing issues are counterbalanced by other things. Even though I agree that Russia being slightly more present in the south than the north has an effect on this mirror relationship, there are other advantages that southern powers have or that these that these mirrored pairs have. For, for example, Austria has an advantage over Germany in that Austria has a, a realistic ability to invade, capture, and then fortify Germany's home centers, especially Munich and Berlin, whereas it's very difficult for Germany to send units over to invade, capture, and fortify Austrian home centers. That's something to consider. There are other little differences between all the powers, but in sum, I agree, and I'll read this one more time. I feel like the board is a slightly distorted mirror with each country, apart from Russia, reflected across the stalemate line. So there are two powers with their own corner, England and Turkey, which have an aggressive relationship with Russia and two central powers, Austria and Germany, which have a defensive relationship with Russia, and two powers which share a corner and aren't threatened by Russia, France and Italy. And because Russia squashed into the south, Austria and Italy are weaker than their mirrors. I think that's fair to say, and I agree, and that's a that's an interesting insight that I, I hope other players meditate on. Again, I don't think that uh, in press diplomacy, the game is uh, really like, the, the, the balancing of press diplomacy is great. It's absolutely great. All power stand a reasonable chance of winning. 
but um, understanding the differences in their strengths and weaknesses, this is really important to playing a good game. So Dave, thanks for your questions. I hope you enjoy my answers. I hope you, this uh, podcast reaches you someday and uh, you find out uh, what I thought about the questions you sent in. Thanks for writing them in. And if anybody else, if anybody else ever uh, is interested in the Diplomacy Dojo and you would like to have your questions answered on this podcast, feel free to write in. Brotherboard at gmail.com is the easiest way to reach me. There are other ways as well. I'm on Discord, uh, Brotherboard, hashtag 1999. This episode was made possible by the generous support of people like you. For more information, visit patreon.com slash brotherboard. You can learn more from your board brother at brotherboard.com. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe, share, and review. And thanks to Loyalty Freak Music for the theme music, It Feels Good to Be Alive too.